This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. On Monday, the Pulitzer Prizes were announced. Among those who won was the staff at Futuro Media and PRX for the podcast Suave. This was how the podcast co-host, the award-winning journalist Mariana Hossa, responded yesterday on Twitter. Guys, we won a Pulitzer! We won a Pulitzer Prize! We won a Pulitzer for Suave! What? I didn't even, I mean, it's like I never even thought of winning a Pulitzer. Marina Hossa founded Futura Media in 2010 and says it's now leaving its mark in American history. Today, we go back a year ago to our interview last March, when the now Pulitzer Prize-winning Suave podcast series was first released. Democracy Now!'s Juan Gonzalez and I spoke with Marina Hossa and her source, Suave. We end today's show with two people who met almost 30 years ago. It was 1993 when the acclaimed journalist Mariana Hossa met David Luis Suave Gonzalez while she was giving a talk at the Greaterford State Correctional Institution in Pennsylvania. Suave was there serving a life sentence without parole after he was convicted of first degree homicide when he was 17 years old. At the prison, he was part of the largest population of so-called juvenile lifers in the United States. Suave and Inahosa stayed in touch through letters and visits and phone calls that she recorded. Those calls are now part of a new seven-part podcast series called Suave that chronicles his story all the way to unexpected freedom. It includes dramatic exchanges like this one from 2016, when the Supreme Court ruled it's unconstitutional to impose mandatory sentences of life without parole on juveniles. The ruling was retroactive and gave thousands of people, including Suave, a chance at freedom. This is a clip of the call, um, his call to announce the good news to Maria. Thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Hello, hello. Hello, Maria. How are you doing this morning? Suave, it is Friday, June 9th at 1044 in the morning. What's going on? I thought we were going to talk at 2. What happened? I want you to let you know that the judge told the lawyer this morning we don't have to wait no longer. June 26, 17 days from today, we bring him to court so he could go see for in July. What? <laughs> so it, it's like it's like totally not a normal day for you in prison after 30 years. Today is. No. You won't even imagine. I had a dream like that I was eating Chinese food. <laughs> what What were you eating? Egg roll and some pork fried rice, and then I woke up. <laughs> and I'm in the head. That's a clip from the podcast Suave. Episode 3 just came out Tuesday, continues to follow Suave's journey as he eventually was given the opportunity to experience life on the outside as an adult for the first time. Suave's now in his 50s, living in the free world as an artist and activist. Joining us now for more, along with Mariana Hossa, president and founder of the Futuro Media Group and the anchor and executive producer of the Peabody award-winning show Latino USA. She's executive producer of the podcast. Suave. Welcome you both to Democracy Now! Suave, if you could briefly I mean, your story is an unbelievable one, but the significance of going to prison in the 80s, you lived in the Bronx, moved to Philadelphia, you were convicted, thought you'd be life in prison without parole, then the Supreme Court made this decision. Yes. Um, thank you for having me on. And um, it was an, uh, an experience that I would never forget and don't wish on no juvenile in the United States. It was an experience that left me traumatized to this day. And I'm just grateful that I was able to meet Maria in 1993 and was able to make that transformation from prison into a decent human being, because at the time, in 1993, I was on a suicide mission. I wanted to die. I didn't know how I was going to get out of jail. All I knew is that I was sentenced to life in the state of Pennsylvania, which housed more juvenile lifers than any other state in the country. And I was, and I was stuck. And here comes a stranger telling me that I could be the voice for the voiceless. 
And so, Avi, could you talk about that first uh, time you met Maria Hinojosa and the relationship uh, as it developed over the years from your perspective? Yes, I met Maria Hinojosa in 1993. I, I was just coming out of solitary confinement. And an uh, older gentleman gave me a radio that had three stations. And one of the stations Maria was on, so I heard it, and I was impressed just to hear a Latina voice on the radio. So I just told everybody, we got to get her up here to the prison to speak to the guys. We got to get her up here. So one of my friends was the institutional tutor, and he graduated that year, like 27 guys with GED. So he was given the opportunity to bring a guest speaker. And I begged him, bring Maria up here, bring Maria. And somehow they got Maria up there. And they told me I couldn't get into the graduation because I wasn't graduating. So I was fine with that because I was doing time in a corrupt jail. There, there was no way I was not going to get into that graduation and meet Maria. So I got in and Maria spoke. And when she took the podium, I just felt that every word that she was, every word that was coming out of her mouth, I felt like she was talking directly to me. And even though it was an auditorium full of people graduating, I just felt like her message was for me. So when she was done speaking, I, I went up to her and I, and I told her, I'm serving life. What can I do? And Maria just looked at me and said, you could be my source. You could be the voice for the voiceless. And those simple words changed my life. The voice for the voiceless. And at the moment, I didn't understand what it meant. But then it dawned on me, like, all my life I've been told I was mentally retarded. I had an IQ of 56, that I would never amount to nothing. And here's a stranger telling me, a lifer, that I could be the voice for the voiceless. I was lit. I was, like, excited just to have somebody tell me that I could be something, that I could be somebody. And that's what changed my life. And Maria, if you could talk about your experience of first meeting Suave and the relationship that you and Suave had over not the months, not the years, the decades, and what it meant to you when you got that call, that this um, young man who you expected to live for the rest of his life in prison, who was your source, um, was now going to be free. All right. Well, listen, I just got to put some credit where credit is due. I learned from the best. I was watching people like Juan Gonzalez. I was reading Juan. I was watching and listening to you, Amy. You were my boss. Remember way back when, when I was a budding journalist um, at WBAI. And one of the things that I learned from you and the great journalists in our tradition, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, eh, Ruben Salazar, is that you you also can lead with your heart. You can be the most critical journalist possible, but you can also lead with your heart. So Suave likes to give me a lot of credit for the words that I said, you know, hey, you're going to be inside here. Just tell me what's happening inside a maximum security men's prison. But the point is, is that he was the one who walked up to me. He was the one who asked the question, what can I do? He didn't say to me, do something for me. Get me out of here. Here's my case. Let's talk about which a lot of the other guys did. Suave said, what can I do? And, you know, I didn't know Suave. I didn't know that he was illiterate. I didn't know that he had been accused of committing a murder uh, against another juvenile. I didn't know that. I saw that there was something in him that had a question. And as a journalist, if you are aware and you are sensitive and you are working with your five senses and sometimes your sixth, you have to pick up on that. Now, uh, Look, I'm a, I'm a Christmas card lady. Uh, I should be sending you and Juan Christmas cards, but I just never got your addresses. But I knew where Suave was going to be for the rest of his life, and I started sending him Christmas cards because I wanted—I I don't know, that that's a human thing to do. And from there, we just—I mean, I never imagined that it would end up being a podcast that is getting this amount, amount of attention and so much love and raising critical issues around justice— um, for young people in our country. And, and so I'm so thankful, Amy. And I know that this is a dream come true for Suave to be with you and Juan right now. And so you're helping to make his dreams come true as well. And Maria, the, uh, the thought process that made you decide to do a podcast uh, uh, once she was, uh, he was out in terms of uh, what the importance 
of uh, of this kind of journalism is in terms, especially with the national debate going on continually now about criminal justice reform. Right. So look, you know, people talk about numbers and they talk about institutions, but until you actually meet someone who has been in this, I mean, Suave was in solitary confinement, not for days or weeks or months, but for years. What does that do to a human being? Look, I I just had a little recorder, Juan, and I when I realized that the Supreme Court was going to be addressing the question of whether or not it was um, inhuman to sentence a juvenile to life without parole, I just started recording every single car, call that Suave made. I went back and I reported. I had visited him a couple of times. Um, but I just said, something can happen here. And look, this is a message to fellow journalists out there. You need to hold on to your stories. You need to learn from the Juans and the Amys, and in this case, the Marias of the world, who are journalists of conscience in the United States. And we understand that there is not just a human story, but there is a story that we can, with one human story, really uncover um, all of this injustice. And so... I never imagined, Juan, that it would be a podcast like this, but you start recording and 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 that's where you capture the most dramatic moments because, you know, Suave and I were just very real with each other over decades.